All right, let's get into it. So I want to welcome Chris Watkins, our board member, and he heads the mentor program. He is going to introduce our keynote. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Barb. Good evening. As Barb said, Chris Watkins, I serve on the board, also direct the mentorship program. But I have the distinct pleasure tonight to introduce our keynote speaker. And uh, Pat Filatico is a uh, distinguished leader uh, in business as well as in the community. And I got to know Pat personally because we both worked at IBM. Uh, she was a sales executive and I got to see firsthand her excellent skills but also willingness to learn and grow. Uh, one of the things that I admire most about Pat is that she is passionate about the community and her family. Uh, she's a distinguished servant leader which makes her perfectly uh, suited to lead the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. So she's the CEO there, and she's agreed to come and speak to us tonight about servant leadership. So let's welcome Pat. Okay. So good evening. How's everyone doing? Well, I'm thrilled to be with you. As I was having conversations with Chris and Kyle and Barb, talking about what makes this group special. It's not just that you create great results for your companies and are putting our community on the map for the innovation that you bring, but you do it in a way that uplifts all of those folks that you work with. And that is, as far as I'm concerned, the definition of servant leadership. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time with you talking about what servant leadership is and offer to you my perspective on why it aligns beautifully with sales. I want you to take a moment and just think about your best sales leader. Give me some words. What does that person bring images up for you? What are the words that you would use to describe that person? Shout, coach. Derek. <laughs> Giving. Passion. 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 Driven. Driven. Advice. 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 Collaborative. Collaborative. Never once in that definition did I hear you say, kick ass sales results. <laughs> Why didn't you? Because it's about how they helped you deliver those results, how they invested and poured into you that made all of the difference. Now I want you to think a moment, if they served you, who do you serve? Put in your mind for a moment, who do you serve every day? Tell me. Okay, how many of you are the sales leader? Answering the word customers. Do you do it every day or do your people do it every day? So who do you serve? The servant leader serves those in their direct line of responsibility. When I first heard the term servant leadership, I heard it from Carol Tomei at the Home Depot. They define their model as the inverted pyramid where the founder sat at the bottom of that point supporting all of the levels of leadership till ultimately their 100% focus was on the store associates. And if the store associates were supported, then Home Depot was doing pretty well. So that's the one thing that I think we all need to remember. In all of the businesses that we run, our job is to, is to really support the people who deliver our products, who touch our customers, who engage for success. So with that out of the way, let me define servant leadership according to Robert Greenleaf, who is credited with being the father of the modern movement of servant leadership. He said a few things. I'm going to cover a few of them today. The first is, he, is that it starts with the natural desire to serve, to serve first, and then conscious choice leads us to aspire to lead. Natural. Why do we put that word in the definition? Because that natural desire cannot be faked. That natural desire cannot be taught. You can develop it over your lifetime, 
with great role models, but it comes from who you are. It comes from your caring compassion. It comes for, from your belief that it's your role to support the growth of others. And then from there, we learn to lead from a servant's perspective. In your uh, program, we have a little pullout card that looks like this. And it gives you a little bit more insight because it might be hard to read from the back of the room. But this is what we call Mr. Greenleaf's servant leadership model. In the center is that natural desire to serve. And then we serve from three perspectives. We serve ourselves first. We have to be fully aware of who we are if we're really going to support others. Then we talk about who we are with others. And we talk about how we listen and coach, give feedback, and also uh, persuade. And then how do we, by focusing ourselves, we're our best selves. We then help others be their best selves. We then serve our organizations so that we achieve our visions, we drive alignment around strategies, and we deliver the results. When we talk about servant leadership, we have to talk about all of those components. If you've heard about servant leadership before, some people might say, well, he's a really nice guy. He cares about me. But he's not, too hard, or not really focused on the results. That's not a servant leader. A servant leader is as focused on the results as he is on the relationships through which he delivers those results. Because we can't meet those we serve and provide for their highest priority needs unless we're delivering results. People can't draw a salary. We cannot give back to our community. We can't invest in the relationships with our trading partners. Results are essential. <coughs> so one of the things as we think about servant leadership is really beginning to understand clearly what are the highest priority needs of those that we serve. Is our teams or the people that we work with in the community, what do they need? And by focusing on that, learning that, then you can serve really well. If you go back to that little model, I believe that there are two places that natural salespeople shine in this model to begin with. Right? They tend to be great listeners. How are you going to figure out how to package the solution your client is looking for unless you're listening for the needs? So they're really good at that. And persuasion and, and uh, selling all go to hand in hand. Right? Only the client is going to say yes. You can bang your head on the wall all day long trying to force the client to say yes, but only they do it. So when you learn how to meet their needs and convey the reason why this is important to them, then the deal gets closed, right? So natural salespeople are already good in two parts of this model. But what about the sales leader? What is it that the sales leader needs to focus on? And this is one of the things that through my sales career at IBM, I needed to learn. Because when I first was a sales manager, not a sales leader, I knew how to do it one way. And that was my way. And if you didn't do it my way, we would be having conversations. I learned over time that wasn't a very effective strategy. And once you learn to really invest in others, I found that not only was it more effective, but it was actually more joyful. So let's talk a little bit about the components that I feel are essential for sales leaders to really develop. The first is around self-awareness. Greenleaf said that the aware awareness is not a giver of solace. It's quite the opposite. It should be a disturber and an awakener. Any of you ever watch Seinfeld? when it originally came out on TV, because there's only a few of us that, all right. <laughs> the rest of you have watched the reruns. So let me give you just a little example of self-awareness. Speaking of having it all. <laughs> Where were you? I went to the beach. Oh, the beach. <laughs> Stop working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Why did it all turn out like this for me? I had so much promise. 
I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking, but I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. Can I come over there? It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Tuna on toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad, on rye. Untoasted, with a side of potato salad, and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna, because salmon swim against the current, and the tuna swim with it. Good for the tuna. Uh, George, you know, that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah. I should do the opposite. I should. If every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> yes. I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh... I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. <laughs> oh, yes, I was. You just ordered these same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. <laughs> I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> All right. You did not come to to expect George Costanza was going to be a part of teaching you anything about servant leadership. But he does it beautifully, especially in this area of self-awareness. Because at the beginning of this piece, George knows about himself, right? He knows about himself. He knows the kind of results he gets just by being him. But I suggest to you that that's only one part of self-awareness. Because you need to know enough about yourself and about others to decide whether or not you're having the positive impact you want to have. So as sales leaders, it's important for us to think about me being my great, outgoing, rambunctious, party person me, what am I doing to the rest of my sales team when I'm fully myself? Am I enriching them? Am I uplifting them? Or could I be diminishing them in some way. You know, standing up to your leadership level. Are you bringing them up with you? Are you stretching? George had a stretch to get over his natural inclination so that he could connect with this lady. And then later on, you see how he go, takes her on a date, and he gets a new job, and everything's wonderful, because he learned to stretch from his point of perspective. The next piece we talk about is foresight. And foresight is, is said to be the lead the leader has, to the sense of being able to know the unknowable and foresee the unforeseeable. So when the few of us in the room worked at IBM, uh, Marva and Chris, we call this thing, uh, we call this thing strategic, uh, creative, uh, I'm sorry, strategic insights. And it scared me because I didn't find, think I was all that strategic. But what I learned over time is foresight has nothing to do with being overly creative. What it has to do with is being able to see patterns, to be able to pull in your past perspective, apply it to today, and then project what might happen in the future. Why is this important? 
you've got a deal, you're going to give away margin, margin, margin to get that deal done in the quarter. And then next quarter, you've just reset the bar. And that client's going to expect that again and again because clients are smart, they get trained, right? So our foresight tells us we know this. How are we going to adjust our behavior in the moment so that when we look back from the future, this was a good decision to make, right? That's what foresight's all about. I would have told you a story about uh, Abraham Lincoln that was a little bit longer, but we're going to run out of time. Lincoln was great with foresight. Lincoln lost so many elections, but there was one in particular that he bowed out of. And the reason that he did is that he, while polling in second, he was splitting the majority vote with the guy in third. And what he knew is that if he stayed in the race, they would both lose. And the person who did not support the end of slavery would have moved on to Congress for the state of Illinois. So his decision, knowing that, was, I've got to back out because bad things will happen if I stay in. That's our lesson about foresight. We build people, we move, go from people using to people building. We think about the results of our organization as this is what we need to do, and all of these people are going to help us get that done. A servant leader thinks about it a little differently. The servant leader thinks about it as the people are my job, and the result is the collective um, output of all of us doing our best together. I had the opportunity to speak to some folks at Starbucks a couple weeks ago, and one of the things that I remarked upon was an article that Howard Schultz had, uh, had done in Fortune. And he was talking to the interviewer for about 20 minutes, and the interviewer turned to him and said, we haven't talked about coffee yet. And he said, yes, because coffee is what I sell, but my people are my passion. So we do a lot with feedback. We, and when we talk about feedback, when I teach it, I remind people the important things about feedback is that you start by showing that you can take it as well as you can give it. You should celebrate more than you correct. You do it in a timely fashion. You focus on the facts and you, and you move forward. You're not going to be blaming. You're going to be encouraging always focusing on the lessons to be learned. And a good friend of feedback is, of course, um, coaching. I focus on a very simple model. But the reality for a servant leader is coaching is not advising. Coaching is not teaching. Coaching is helping somebody that you're working with go from where they are today to where they want to be. And you focus on two major skills when you, when you coach. You're an outstanding listener, and you ask probing questions. You don't suggest. You bring out the plan from the person you're coaching. And then Greenleaf's best test. Mr. Greenleaf gave us a few things, as I said. The first, the natural desire to serve and serve first. The second was the best test. How do we know we're doing it very well? We know it because the people that we serve grow as people. They grow healthier. They grow wiser. They grow freer and more autonomous, more likely themselves to be servants. And the least privileged are benefited or at least not further deprived. That's a lot to hold yourself to. And you might ask yourselves, how can I do all of that? What's my role in all of that? Healthier, think about whether or not you're bringing stress or pulling stress out of the environment where you're serving. Wiser, it's not just about giving people the technical skills that they need, but helping them grow in judgment, helping them grow in com commitment to what your organization's all about. Freer and more autonomous, do they learn from mistakes? Are mistakes used as learning instruments? Or are there punishments for making mistakes within your organization? 
more likely than themselves to be servants? Are they learning as you role model these behaviors to share those behaviors with others? And then finally, some of you may have thought servant leadership was all about giving back to the community before we started, but that's just one component of it. And one of the things that we focus on when we think about the least privileged in our society is to serve them in a very unique way. Everything I do and everything I do professionally, my life has been shaped by seven years of work as a young man in Africa. From 1971 to 1977, I look young, but I'm not. <laughs> I worked in Zambia, Kenya, Ivory Coast, Algeria, Somalia, in projects of technical cooperation with African countries. I worked for an Italian NGO. And every single project that we set up in Africa failed. And I was distraught. I thought, age 21, that we Italians were good people and we were doing good work in Africa. Instead, everything we touched, we killed. <laughs> Our first project, the one that has inspired my first book, Ripples from the Zambezi, was a project where we Italians uh, decided to teach Zambian people how to grow food. So we arrived there with Italian seeds in southern Zambia in this absolutely magnificent valley uh, going down to the Zambezi River and we taught the local people how to grow Italian tomatoes and zucchini. And and of course, the local people had absolutely no interest in doing that, so we paid them to come and work. And sometimes they would show up. <laughs> and we were amazed that the local people in such fertile valley would not have any agriculture. And, uh, but instead of asking them how come they were not growing anything, we simply said, thank God we're here. <laughs> Just in the nick of time to save the Zambian people from starvation. <laughs> And of course, everything in Africa grew beautifully, and we had these magnificent tomatoes. In, in Italy, a tomato would grow to this size, in Zambia, to this size. And we could not believe, and we were telling the Zambians, look how easy agriculture is. When the tomatoes were nice and ripe and red, overnight, some 200 hippos came out of the, from the river, and they ate everything. <laughs> We said to the Zambians, my God, the hippos. <laughs> and the Zambians said, yes, that's why we have no agriculture here. <laughs> why didn't you tell us? You never asked. So as you go forth from here tonight, after we celebrate the great successes, and you want to grow as a servant leader, your heart is full, and you're focused on who, that person that you choose to serve, I suggest before you pile on all your love, ask them how they choose to be served, and then act consistent with that. I thank you for your time. So thank you so much. I, I really uh, can't, can't thank you so much for bringing this out. Um, you guys are all servant leaders, and what's really cool is that the reason that these people are here is because they were nominated for being those. And those people that sent your names in, along with 91 other people, really did so because you guys have made their lives better, and they admire you for what you do, and you improve their lives, and that's amazing. And you should give yourself a round of applause for that. So the, center, uh, the Greenleaf Center is a nonprofit. Thank you to the sponsors who have helped us make a $1,000 donation in the name of this society to continue on your great work and help the sustainability of our ecosystem. Thank you, Thank you so much. You'll see that you got a book, The Contemporary Servant Leader. 
Again, as part of your, your ticket here, um, that's written uh, from the Greenleaf Society, and it has a lot of great stuff in it, and, and I think that's become a tradition for us that you come back with something, you learn something when you come to one of these events.